Once in the lifetime of every bride-to-be comes a day which will always colour her memories of home. As Jane, only daughter of Mr and Mrs Charles Wilson, could tell you, it's the day when she first wears her wedding dress. In richly embroidered white organza, it shimmers with the beauty of Diamante and Mother of Pearl. Softly she walks, and if maybe her steps are uncertain, she can always look to Mama for advice. Whether the maternal touch means as much to the bridesmaids, well, Christine and Victoria just have to take it, while Patricia takes in what she can of Valerie's technique. Technique of another kind, David Ersdale's preview of the bride. If he was embarrassed, what price had other David, with Clifton College in mind? As for Charles Wolfson himself, well, he's in the background now. It's an occasion in family life when mother takes command. Jane has been put through her dress rehearsal by her most critical audience. Held by a small orange blossom coronet, her veil, like her dress, takes midsummer for its motive. Could anything be lovelier for a July bride? To 47 Grosvenor Square comes a very special visitor, anxious, as only a future mother-in-law can be, that the bride shall look her best. Radiant with happiness, Mrs. Herney Stern wears for the occasion a pale grey satin dress, which Norman Hartnell could describe better than I. And so do a close-up view of the presence. High over the many tokens of friendship and affection, the portrait of the late Solomon Wolfson, J.P., gazes down. A fitting touch, this, for the happiness of his grandchildren was very close to him. So, to Jane's mother come her final duties. And in her performance of them, there is a quality which all mothers will understand. Fashionable London thronged St John's Wood Synagogue to welcome the bride at the end of her last drive as Miss Jane. And happy augury, sunlight greeted her too as she passed into the care of her father for the walk down the aisle. The seriousness with which Patricia discharged her duties as chief bridesmaid brought to the solemn occasion a warm, human touch. So, beneath the ancient canopy of Israel, the two young people exchanged their vows. Following the religious ceremony, the marriage register awaited them. With witnesses Max Kettner and Effie Prop in close attendance, Jane, Nay Wolfson and Jerome Stern signed their names as man and wife. The date of the entry never to be forgotten, July the 6th, 1952. So to the end of the ceremonies and the start of festivities ahead, a night to be remembered at the Dorchester where the wedding reception was held. Specially welcomed were Alice and Arthur Levin. As medical advisor to the family, Doc Levin had certainly done his stuff. Even the bride arrived on time. A close-up of Jane shows she was standing up well. But after 500 handshakes, Jerry needed something he always needs at bridge, a new hand, with which to greet Mr. and Mrs. Clifford Morgan. That medical board might come in useful yet. And now, Charles's youngest sister, Bibi Steinberg, with her husband, Jack, and Catherine. Keep your eye on your cousin, Jane. One chance, and she'll steal more than the picture. 
It's crowded enough now, even for England's best ballroom couple, Rosie and Sam. Jerry's getting warmed up too. As for that distinguished Scot, Alexander Stone, he'll be able to dodge any girl among the guests. Enjoying every minute, Penny Stern plays her part while David Stern stands on guard for gate crashes. A subject in which Pietro Anigoni might find inspiration for his next successful Royal Academy painting. From San Francisco, from the ends of the earth, they come. And none more welcome than Mrs. Lottie Burson and her daughter. Where's Max? whispers the glamorous Debbie. While the bridesmaids hold a reception all on their own, the bride and bridegroom relax. 600 up, Jerry is ready to call it a draw. The chief rabbi, Dr. Israel Brody, arrives, followed by the co-conspirators, Morty and Annie Prop. Here's where father does his stuff again. No wonder when Ruth and Leonard arrive, we see them covered in smiles. Eddie Rain looks like he's walking on air, though Uncle Harry's more cause he collects. But he's had his day, now he'll have to wait while Betty and Martin pay their respects. Welcome to Ralph Spectreman. Over 70, he always turns up trumps. If he's wondering what's on the cards, maybe David Langdon, the cartoonist, could tell him the answer. Jane shows she's a promising hostess as Paul and Norma Jacobson arrive. Jerry, too. And now, Claude and Olga Henry with Simon Gerstler, caught for at least a tail-end glimpse. All in all, a representative gathering of the clans. So to the banqueting room, where Dabby has found her man. <laughs> Patricia's got the other bridesmaids nicely drilled. As you can see, he's been trained the right way. It's not so easy at first procedure later, in private. Don't relax, Max. After the courses come the discourses, eh, Mr. and Mrs. Ernest Sterling? And the more to the point they are, the behind. Sam's not on the speech list, but he's got a receptive audience. It's a day full of fulfillment for Dr. Morris J, who brought Jane into the world. Day of fulfillment for the bridesmaids, too. Jeannie, Mrs. Max Williams, completes the trio of sisters standing in for the full octet. Proposing the toast for the bride and bridegroom, Mr. Isaac Wolfson weighed every word as though it were gold. And perhaps he was right. Charles Wilson, too, was applauded. Just as Isaac has Edith, so he has Hilda to keep his after-dinner speeches short. Custom was observed, and the celebrations went on. A time-tested ritual in the fine old time-honored way. With head waiter Victor to guide them, things augured well for the young couple a symbol of mutual dependence right from the start. So, with Max Thorpe watching their footwork, over to Jane and Jerry, together for their first dance as husband and wife. Tempo changes, but the harmony goes on as two happy young people start a partnership that will endure for life. Yeah. 